Hello, everyone, and welcome to Medicamentum Authentica. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Kaufman, and I have a returning very special guest tonight, uh, Dr. Dirk Jacobson, to talk about some more uh, tooth-related issues. And uh, today we're going to talk about root canal, tooth decay, and fluoride. So welcome back, Dr. Dirk. Well, thank you for having me again, Andy. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me again. Excellent. Yeah, of course. So uh, we were talking a little bit before the show and mapping things out, and it seemed like you had a lot to say about uh, root canals, and I know this is a, a topic that the people really uh, need some information about because there's so much information and misinformation out there. So uh, why don't you uh, tell us what, are, uh, what you have planned for us today? Well, look, uh, many people approach me in my daily dental surgery about root canals, and uh, there's a lot of controversy around root canals, as you know. And uh, it's a subject that is somehow talked about a bit like amalgam and fluoride. It's a very emotive subject, and there are people on both sides of the spectrum who are passionately somehow defending their arguments. And, uh, shed some light and my personal opinion about root canals. So maybe we should look at why are root canals done in the first place. So root canals are uh, done because, first of all, to remove pain. Because if a patient is in pain, it's mostly related to an infected tooth. And uh, the pain can be relieved if we start a root canal by taking out the nerve or relieving infection. And that's the second uh, reason why root canals are done, because the tooth might be infected and we can remove the infection by starting a root canal. And the third uh, reason why a root canal is done is to preserve a tooth. Because if we uh, cannot do a root canal on a tooth like that, it has to be removed and that has also issues. Because if we remove a tooth, uh, that has consequences in regards to what do we do with the remaining gap? Uh, right. And so the teeth can uh, get all uh, crooked and move around the gap or food can get stuck in there and all kinds of issues like that? Exactly. There's a functional problem uh, related to that. So teeth start to move suddenly. Yeah, they can fall into the gap. Or if you, let's say, if you have a bottom molar removed, what happens with the top tooth that opposes the tooth? So you've got the top tooth, bottom tooth. And if you remove this one, this one is starting to elongate, meaning it grows out and it gets longer. And then more problems start on the top between those teeth on the top. And uh, it gets more and more difficult after a time to replace the bottom tooth. Um, or teeth can fall into the gap and cause problems. Wow. Then, so it seems like uh, if, you know, we can't really look at the mouth in terms of individual teeth, we have to look at it as a whole functioning unit, really, to understand it. I'm wondering if we could back up just a little bit, Dr. Dirk, and could you tell us, like, uh, what happens to lead up to a person getting such a serious tooth infection? Because a root canal is usually, right, not the not the first uh, thing to jump to. It's not when a problem first started starts, right? It has to progress uh, to that point. So how does yeah. that all come about? Well, in most cases, we need to have a root canal because there's an underlying problem, and that is dental decay in most cases. So it starts uh, with a hole in the tooth that is infecting somehow the nerve, which is in the center of the tooth. Actually, Andy, I have prepared something, and maybe we want to look at I just share my screen, as a, uh, <clears throat> if that's all right with you. Yeah, please. So... If we look at a root canal, so let's just start. So if we do a root canal, see this is a tooth and you can see in the top of the tooth there's a little hole starting, yeah? And it starts in the first layer of the tooth, which is the enamel. So, and the hole progresses, goes into the dentin and then it reaches the nerve. And when it reaches the nerve, what happens is that the nerve is infected. And that's when the tremendous pain starts. So people who experience this tremendous, really awful, awful toothache, that's because of the nerve that you see here is infected. <clears throat> but it doesn't stop there. So most people at this point have uh, this awful pain and uh, the nerve of the tooth, which you see here in the center of the tooth, is dying. And at a certain point, the tooth is dead, and then the infection goes all the way into the bone. Uh, and uh, But 
the patient might not feel any trouble at this point in time. So this is, and what the root canal is doing is it cleans out the root canal and takes out all the infected nerve from the inside of the tooth. And hopefully what happens at the end of the tooth, which is not within the tooth anymore, is resolved then. I see. And what 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 kind of time frame does it take for an infection to progress into the nerve like that? Uh, well, that's a that, that can take quite a, a little while. So it often starts with tooth sensitivity, so the tooth becomes hot or cold sensitive, and there are particular symptoms that you that the patient experience where you know that it's irreversible, that the part, the nerve is irreversibly infected. And that is, uh, for example, if you drink cold, often a tooth can be sensitive. That's not really a clear sign. But if it starts to be sensitive and hot and there's lingering pain, then we know that the nerve is packing up and it will not resolve by itself. So that's why a root canal is done. So when we do a root canal, uh, uh, the the positive outcome of a root canal is if we the infection that you saw there, if that resolves, then from a dentist's point of view, that's a successful root canal. But uh, a root canal treated tooth in itself is uh, very much hollowed out, so it's weak. So even if you have a successful root canal, uh, what that means is uh, the treatment doesn't stop with that. You need to preserve the tooth structure so that the weak tooth structure doesn't break if you chew. Right. That's, that's the main reason why uh, root canal treatment fails, because the weak tooth stru structure is not protected by a crown, for example. A crown, if you, have, if you have a tooth, a crown sits over the tooth and it holds it all together. If you just put a filling into the tooth and it doesn't really bond to the tooth, then the tooth can crack and it actually can crack through the center and then the tooth is gone. That's very disappointing and many, many people have lost their teeth because the treatment wasn't followed through all the way to the end. The root canal was done, pain was going away, patient leaves. And for one or the other reason, didn't come back. And then we have these problems that it, the tooth is not preserved properly. I see. Dirk, what is, the, uh, what is the function of the nerve to begin with? Because you're saying in this procedure, right, you're completely removing the remnants of the nerve. So how does that affect the tooth physiology? Well, it, uh, now we suddenly have a, a, a dead tooth in the body, yeah? And uh, this is where most of the critics come in. They say, well, you can't have anything, any dead tissue in the body. But still the surrounding uh, structure of the tooth is still conserved. Uh, so uh, it, it's a, this is where, where the controversy starts. Uh, the nerve of the tooth is, is the living tissue that keeps its teeth alive. They are not like dead bodies. And the nerve is... is or the pulp actually is the living tissue that is somehow connected to the whole vascular system of the body, so to the lymph system and to the, the to the blood system, and it gets nurtured from the inside. So uh, we talk about this later a little bit. I would like to keep that uh, to talk about a little bit later when I come to to the theory on decay, because that's uh, a main part is the living tissue of the tooth. Uh, and if that's all right, I would like to keep going with yeah, the root sure. canal. So yeah, sure. just please. Wanna, So the thing with root canal is uh, the success is somehow determined by the positive outcome of the infection that you saw on the bone. And I would just like to share the screen again. Uh, here we go again. So once we've got the infection here in the bone, uh, that looks on the x-ray like this. So you have at the end of the root, you can see it's all a bit darker. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I, I covered this with the yellow. So this is the infection in the bone. Uh, is, there's an osteolytic process. So the, the bone is dissolved. And the goal of the root canal is that this area starts to heal. So then uh, now you can see on the right hand side, this is a root canal instrument that cleans out the nerve. And once that's done, we can see the before, before the infection, and on the aftershock, you can see the white lines. 
That is the root canal filling in the tooth. And if we look closely, then we can see the dark area. There is bone repair happening, which means that somehow the uh, immune system of the body was capable of dealing with the infection and uh, has resolved the infection and the bone has almost completely healed. Yeah, so this is the goal of any root canal treatment. And I just have one more picture, and this is a full mouth x-ray. This and where you see the yellow arrows pointing, there are some infections visible. I just make that a bit bigger. This is the pathology related to, on the right-hand side, to a failed root canal. So, and this is the big problem with root canals, is that we cannot resolve the infection. So... Right. So, so basically, you take the dead um, nerve root out that has been infected, but the bone underneath the root of the of the tooth stays infected. And yes. what you what you showed there looks kind of like an abscess, right? It's all liquefied, right? There's no uh, solid bone material there. Exactly. And now I come to the uh, to the really bad side of root canals, which is so. Uh, the problem that Western Price, good old Western Price, had somehow investigated um, more than 100 years ago. So what he actually did is, and he pointed out that there's a serious problem with root canals, uh, that it has, uh, it's related to uh, somehow the focal infection theory, that there's always infection left in the bone if you have a root canal. Uh, and what he pointed out is his research was he actually uh, removed a dead tooth, a root canal tooth, treated tooth, from a female patient who had a severe arthritis. And what he did then is he put that tooth uh, under the skin of a healthy rabbit. And within 48 hours, that rabbit developed serious arthritis. So, and he did many, many... Uh, tests like that. So he not only took the tooth, he took the parts of teeth, he ground the tooth structure down and uh, took the powder and implanted it under skin. And what he found is that every uh, those people that he took out the teeth from, who showed particular forms of diseases, the rabbit developed the disease in a short amount of time. And he took those experiments a little bit further. Then he, uh, he grew cultures of the bacteria and put the bacteria, just the bacteria, under the skin, and the same thing happened. But then what he did is he, uh, he separated the bacteria from the culture and took only the fluid that was left over without any bacteria in it and injected or put it under the skin of these rabbits and what happened is that they got even sicker. Even without the bacteria, they got even sicker. And his conclusion was that the endotoxins that were produced by the bacteria were even way more harmful than the bacteria itself. So this, that's the conclusion. That's where the controversy with root canals comes from, because of we cannot resolve the problem, we cannot resolve the infection 100%. Everyone admits this. So even if you go to the root canal specialist, every dentist would would uh, admit that we are not able to uh, resolve an infection of a root canal 100%. That is related to the anatomical structure of the root. They are sometimes bent and there are side canals. We can't get into them. And there will always be bacteria remaining. The question is if the if the immune system is capable of dealing with that infection but uh, many people say no and uh, western price experiments they show that there is an issue and uh, this is you know like uh, the pro root canal side will always say oh well the x-ray is good therefore there shouldn't be a problem and uh, so in a way it's a difficult question so every tooth needs to be somehow evaluated on its own merit, if you do something, you have to weigh up. There's a problem if you take out the tooth. Mostly you can treat it as a dentist really well with the root canal treatment. 
if you monitor and you see the bone healing, bone, if there's bone repair, that's a very good sign. And uh, this is this is always my approach. If I see the bone healing around the tooth, and it's a strategically very important tooth, like for example, a front tooth. If you have a front tooth, what do you do? You pull it out, but you have to replace it somehow. That's, and uh, to replace a tooth like that, involves invasive procedures. You could have a bridge, but that means you have to cut down the neighbor teeth. You could put in an implant, which has also problems. Implants are not problem-free. They can go wrong, they can, and if they go wrong, they can go seriously wrong with a bone around it. So there's a question. You have to weigh things up. Right. So it's very interesting, some of the things you brought up. Uh, so it sounds to me like what you're describing happens here is that um, there is basically non-viable tissue inside the tooth, and the bacteria that are present from your mouth uh, start eating the dead tissue, right? And we know that when bacteria uh, eat dead tissue, um, over time, they're metabolism changes over because of the lack of oxygen and they start producing toxic substances. And essentially that seems to be what uh, the main factor that caused the disease when it was uh, uh, injected into other animals. And it's quite interesting. So, but still, but since there's still dead tissue left behind after the procedure, right, then that bacteria stays there to consume all that dead tissue, right, because that's its job, and in the process continues to create some toxins that can affect us in bad ways, and then, of course, uh, it can damage the surrounding tissues and perpetuate the problem, it sounds like. So what are the alternatives to um, a root canal to address this problem? Is it possible to heal from this infection uh, without a procedure? No. No, uh, because if you if you leave the tooth, um, it once the tooth is dead and the really serious pain is gone, then you have a chronically infected tooth. And uh, now I come to the next point because there's research now because this this argument what what do you do with the root canal tooth or do you leave the dead tissue or do you keep a tooth? Uh, it's there are. Uh, oral sources for oxidative stress, as we know, this could be related to, to gum disease, which is an infection, and uh, they, there's a kind of hierarchy, what's the worst thing? And the worst thing for, for oxidative stress uh, as, as an oral source for, this, for the whole system is these chronic infections and failed root canals. But uh, they, they came to the conclusion that if the bone healing is happening, that means uh, that uh, there's a diminished oxidative stress, and the, uh, actually this is not doesn't even show up on the on the on the biggest point of oxidative stress for root canals. So uh, this is where we still have to weigh up between a chronic infection. So if we can't resolve it, then the tooth has to go, and. And alternatively, then we have to look at alternatives, and I mentioned that earlier, this would be a bridge or an implant or a removable denture, but uh, that's not really, if you have a tooth that is lost and you have to suddenly take out a denture every night that might be wobbling around in your mouth, that's not really a good alternative. You can also leave the gap, if it's, but if you can cope with, this, with the aesthetics, well, fine, but if you can... There are also the consequences that we talked earlier about uh, somehow. Does, does that answer your question, Andy? Yeah, I think so. So it sounds like really the best option is to uh, take really good care of your teeth and not let it get to this point in the first place. And exactly. uh, But if you're in the unfortunate predicament where you're, the inside of your tooth is already dead, it seems like you, you have a couple of choices that are uh, difficult to make. Um, to me, it seems like um, extracting the tooth and putting a bridge is uh, the best uh, chance of a strong long-term outcome, but certainly uh, some people have been successful with root canals. Um, but I, I really uh, take your point that if you start going down that path and have one root canal and then have a second root canal, that you're actually uh, perpetuating the problem going forward in terms of the oxidation of stress and the likelihood of uh, other tooth becoming uh, other teeth becoming compromised yes very true there's no there's no general answer to that question 
because uh, because of the uh, the consequences that you have to face if you remove teeth uh, but also from a holistic point of view the the reasons why you need a root canal in the first place are the same reasons uh, somehow that you develop more systemic diseases as well because uh, somehow the the tooth is a living tissue within the body and maybe uh, we can Go now into our next subject, would would be the systemic theory of decay, because yeah. that plays a role in it. Yeah, let's uh, let's go into that. But I just want to echo your comment because this is a, a really important point to drive home that your oral health actually can be a very um, um, useful indicator of the the total health of your body. Right, and a lot of people have talked about this um, that you could even predict uh, certain other types of illness, right, just from examining a person a person's mouth. So, um, if your mouth is in good shape, chances are the rest of your body is in a pretty healthy condition as well. That's true, and this is often the problem uh, because, see, if people see a doctor with a particular disease, the doctor is not somehow educated or is not full and somehow doesn't pay much attention or. Uh, on what's going on in the mouth and this is maybe where some changes should be happening because even a doctor can point out with uh, easy means and a basic education if the patient opens their mouth if there's something wrong with the mouth and the main thing should be focused on removing any infection that is going in the, on in the mouth because some some things are really obvious and because everything is related uh, to sort out some infection in the mouth would be a good starting point to to relieve any other problems within the body. Right. Well, and you know that uh, medicine is so compartmentalized, right, that, um, you know, doctors are only really paying attention to one uh, small little part of the body. And, and, you know, I'll tell you going through medical school that we got very little education about the mouth at all. Um, we were pretty much just told to look for cancerous lesions there. And, um, you know, in my experience working with lots of physicians, I, I never see them look in the mouth at all. They look in the throat, of course, but they never look around the teeth and gums and under the tongue and inside the cheeks, you know, and, unless there uh, is a specific problem that they're asked to address there. And then usually the only determination is, uh, well, do you need to go to a dentist or not? Yes, exactly. Yeah. But it's pretty, I mean, uh, it doesn't take much expertise just to look into the mouth and, and uh, ask a few questions. And the main things, if you have really bad gum disease, you can spot that often, even as a non-expert, non-dentist. Or if there's something really bad going on, you can see rotten teeth or whatever. And uh, yeah, so that might be a good point to discuss. <laughs> well, you know, to just joking around, we did have this kind of a uh, thing when I was in medical school that uh, if uh, the person had less teeth than they did tattoos, that was a really bad sign in terms of prognosis for them. That's, uh, that's the point, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Dirk, uh, you're going to tell us about the theory of tooth decay. Now, we've all uh, grown up uh, with... Uh, being told about tooth decay, right? That say they tell us to not eat sweets and to uh, brush our teeth with uh, fluoride toothpaste, right? And get fluoride treatments at the dentist and and such. So why don't you tell us uh, how valid that is, or what is the uh, the true thinking on on tooth decay? Uh, well, uh, all the thinking on tooth decay and how dental decay develops is based on uh, uh, on a theory that was established by. Dr. Miller, who, lived, uh, who established the theory in 1890. And it basically comes in two stages. So the first stage is somehow that an acid attacks and demineralizes the, the surface layer of your tooth. And in the second stage, the organic matter of the tooth is dissolved. So they look at, uh, at, the, at tooth decay and uh, tooth disease just as an external thing. It doesn't take into account anything that might be happening within the body. And this theory was established in the 1940s. It was somehow cemented. But there were other theories around at the time. Uh, but they were, from then on until now, they are also dealt with as some sort of fringe concepts that are not really dealt with in a serious way. 
Uh, but the, the Miller's theory doesn't really take into account that the tooth is a part of the whole body and it's related to the body. Now, there was some research done in, starting in the late 50s by a dentist called Dr. Steinman, and he hooked up with an endocrinologist, with Dr. Leonora. And what they somehow uh, found is that there's a lymphatic uh, flow going from the gut all the way to the bone, to the, to the jawbone, into the teeth. And uh, this lymphatic flow is very important for the health of the teeth. So if this uh, flow, and uh, let me just share the screen again because I have some interesting uh, pictures in regards to that. Uh, if this lymphatic flow, oh, where are we here? So let us just uh, start with the tooth. So this is a tooth, and you can see the anatomy. We can see the enamel, the dentin, the pulp, and the root canal. And on the bottom, you see the, the blood vessels going into the root canal. Now, this lymphatic flow is going all the way from the gut into the tooth, and then somehow all the way through the tooth to the outside of the tooth. So the tooth is somehow sweating. And this is a happy tooth. If we have this, this positive flow, it acts a little bit like an internal toothbrush. And uh, if we get to this stage, then the tooth is healthy. But this, this in inside outflow can easily reverse into uh, somehow an outside inflow. And if that happens, then all the toxins from the inside, from the outside, from bacteria, they get somehow sucked into the tooth and if that happens we we have the the conditions for the tooth to develop decay and they what they did is they they did some animal testing where they uh, where they injected some uh, fluid into the gut of animals like uh, like rats actually and they found uh, this fluid this lymph fluid going all the way from the gut and it they could see it in, in the pulp of the teeth uh, six minutes later and it was entering the dentin only an hour later. So we have this internal flow. There's, it's, it's, uh, it's like an internal toothbrush. And if that happens, then uh, plaque and bacteria can't settle on the tooth because they are somehow washed away. And if that doesn't happen, and, and this is all related to hormonal uh, regulation, what they found is, if, if we have the healthy tooth, it's because of the parotid gland, the parotid gland that sits in the cheek. It was, it, it, it's mostly known because of its, its excreting saliva into the mouth, but it also has an endocrine function. It releases parotid hormone. And if this parotid hormone is released, then we have this inside outflow. So the internal toothbrush is happening. And, uh, they were really struggling with how did this, when is this parot, parotid hormone activated? And then they came later to the conclusion that it was regulated by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus actually acted a little bit like a switch. So if the hypothalamus was, was activated, what happened is it, it sent the signal out, parotid hormone was produced, and we have a healthy flow. But if the hypothalamus didn't send out the signal, parotid hormone was not produced, and suddenly the tooth acted like a sponge. Wow. So, so this is the hypothalamus, right? Part of the of what they call the HPA axis or the hypothalamic pituitary axis that's involved in regulating many of our endocrine or hormone systems. Exactly. So are the parotid glands connected directly to the hypothalamus, or do they go through the HPA axis? Well, the, the hypothalamus sends the sends a signal, and that is somehow guided by the food intake that we have. So, if we have, if we, for example, have a nutritious, nutritious, very nutritious food, uh, vitamin K two has a big part in it. Then it it has sends the signal to the parotid gland, and then we've got the positive flow. But if we have sugary intake lots of carbohydrate, processed food, then uh, then the, uh, the hypothalamus, like with the insulin, 
uh, it, it sends the signal to to the to the pancreas for the insulin somehow to be activated, but uh, that at the same time stops the signal for the parotid gland. Wow. So, so if I. Yeah. Right. So is vitamin K2 the main um, uh, vitamin that uh, sets off this positive uh, signal flow or there is it the whole complement of the Weston A price factors? Uh, yeah, I think it's the, the whole picture, but vitamin K2 has a big part in it. Right. So let me just remind people out there that vitamin K2, uh, which is not necessarily listed as an essential vitamin, uh, they talk about vitamin K1, which is involved in blood clotting. But uh, vitamin K2 was the missing factor that was discovered by Weston A. Price and later identified as K2. And it's something that it can be difficult to get in your diet. So I want to remind everyone that the main source of vitamin K2 would be from grass-fed animals. Mm -hmm. And it's important that they be 100% grass-fed because they actually convert the vitamin K1 that's present in the grass to vitamin K2 in their body. The only uh, vegetarian source of vitamin K2 is from certain fermented foods. And uh, some of the fermented foods that have it in the highest quality would include natto, which is a type of uh, fermented soybeans. Uh, it can be uh, culinarily uh, challenging to appreciate, but uh, it certainly is one of the highest sources. Yes. And uh, I've heard, I've never tried it, but it's supposed to be not. A, a taste that you have to get used to. That's well, that I've I've heard that um, uh, in Japan that some restaurants actually have a separate dining room for people who are connoisseurs of natto, so that they don't uh, disturb the other diners. So, oh, right. <laughs> but you know, yeah. other fermented foods uh, certainly have it to lesser degrees, and this is a uh, you know something that if you uh, want to uh, stay vegan or vegetarian, I suggest that you uh, do some further research about. Mm. Yes, but that's the only uh, uh, only source where where vegetarians can get it from is that natto. Yeah. Well, see uh, now this this theory of of Miller. Yeah, as uh, as we discussed, is only focusing of on the outer shell of the tooth. It's all about the enamel. Enamel to to somehow um, not have in the enamel attacked by the acids. That's the only focus of dentistry, to, to protect the enamel. They don't take into account that there might be hormones that, that regulate uh, somehow the, the, the inside-out flow that keeps the tooth clean. So what dentistry has done is, by focusing just on this outside shelf of the tooth, the enamel, uh, they, they came up with the fluoride. Because the fluoride is supposed to remineralize and strengthen the tooth. So uh, what what dentistry has been doing ever since is to use fluoride to strengthen the tooth by changing some ions to change to, to put in the fluoride into the into the tooth structure that makes it more acid resistant. So that's the right. only <clears throat> Now fluoride fluoride is not naturally in our tooth structure though. No, it's not. It's not fluoride. So we're you're talking about su substituting calcium or phosphorus with fluoride. Not right, the calcium and the phosphor. It's the hydroxide uh, ion that uh, needs oh, to Oh, I see. Okay, so instead of hydroxyapatite, it's going to be uh, fluoroapatite. Exactly. And okay, then, so uh, just to explain to the people out there, we're talking about how the uh, basically the teeth or other bones would be hardened. So uh, the way that your teeth and other bone structures are constructed by your body is that first there is a uh, collagen-based protein matrix, and then your body deposits a mineral layer to harden that into a bony-like structure, and it's called uh, calcium hydroxyapatite is the main material, which involves a calcium phosphorate and a hydroxy ion. So what uh, Dr. Dirk is telling us is that the purpose of the fluoride is actually to substitute uh, fluoride in part of that structure and change the physical properties of the teeth. So in a sense, these are making our teeth to be not the natural way that they're supposed to be. Exactly, exactly. And uh, we haven't really investigated what that means. Because uh, everybody seems to think, well, it's just the enamel that's stuck, dead structure anyway. Uh, 
But if, if we change something with the enamel, it, it certainly there's enough research out there that proves that it makes the, in, that the, the tooth more resistant to acids. So once we have uh, fluor appetite in the enamel, it makes it more resistant, but it comes at a huge price. Uh, if we, because the fluoride, uh, we have to also talk about water fluoridation compared to topical fluoridation. Because everybody, uh, the, the fluoride, and this is acknowledged worldwide, even by the water fluoridation uh, active uh, the proponents, that fluoride only works topically. So you can put it on the tooth and the, flu the, the fluor appetite is, is developing because the fluor is integrated into the enamel of the tooth. But the big problem starts if you give it systemically. And this is where water fluoridation comes in. And there are only a few countries in the world who are doing that. Uh, the US is one, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, there are little parts of the UK and in Ireland are doing it in the Western world, where Israel is doing it as well. Uh, but, for example, see, I'm from Germany. In Germany, it's, uh, we don't have it there. In Europe, it's not a big, big deal. 97 or 98 percent of Western Europe is rejecting water fluoridation for reasons of they, they didn't see the point uh, because everybody knows it's not doing anything systemically. Yeah? It's only working topically. And because of whom human rights issues and uh, they didn't want any forced medication because it, it is a drug. Fluoride is a drug that is put into water to somehow provoke some physical changes in your body. That's what this drug is for. It's not uh, to improve the quality of the water or anything. It's a drug that is there to make physical changes in the body. Yeah, I'd like to uh, expand on that a little bit because um, fluoride initially came from aluminum mining and it was a toxic byproduct of aluminum mining and it had been used as a poison in some other applications, like for example as rat poison. And when the idea or perhaps the discovery that it may have some application to tooth decay, um, there was a decision, right, to start selling it to uh, municipalities to put in the water supply. And it was very profitable to the aluminum mining industry because it cost them money to dispose of this waste product previously, especially because of it being toxic. And they had to take special procedures. And now they were actually able to sell it to various uh, towns and cities to put in the water supply. So, like you said, I've always wondered this myself, how is swallowing fluoride going to help your teeth? I see the possibility of applying it topically on the teeth, as you mentioned, but this systemic ingestion of fluoride is something totally different. And you call it a drug, I would actually call it a toxin. Um, even the Centers for Disease Control in the United States um, put out a warning in the early 2000s um, instructing parents of newborns not to use fluoridated water to mix infant formula because it was a toxic to the nervous system. And there's lots of documentation, especially about neurotoxicity from fluoride. So it's something that I recommend everyone filter out of their drinking water. Well, very true. And uh, even the ADA has now admitted that uh, you shouldn't uh, use it into baby formula because, see, uh, the breast milk is actually probably the best nutrition that's available to us. And it doesn't contain any fluoride. We have to ask, why is that? Why is there no, even, it, 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 uh, but, but if we use baby formula made from drinking water, uh, it probably has a 250 or 300 times the amount of fluoride in it. And this is uh, the main reason why a disease called fluorosis develops, because if infant, infants uh, have too much exposure of fluoride uh, at that young age because of the baby formula, they develop later in teenage years something which is called fluorosis. And fluorosis is a weakening of the enamel. So what it's doing is that uh, the enzymes of the fluoride, they somehow uh, have a negative impact on the enamel-forming cells in the body, which are the ameloblasts. 
So they are compromised and they throw out enamel that is of, of, of poor quality. It's hypomineralized. But it has also a cosmetic issue because it can be quite disfiguring. It has brown spots, white, white spots. And if it's a severe case, I mean, I have teenagers who are not wanting to smile anymore because they, uh, they are very self-conscious of it and, and it has psychological problems uh, resulting from it. Because if, if, you don't, if you have kind of teeth that are mottled or dark, uh, you, many of these young kids, they feel hesitant to, to show their smile. And of course, you as a psychiatrist can relate to that. That has, has quite an impact on their development. Absolutely. And, and uh, it's, it's now estimated that more than 40% of, uh, of American teenagers show fluorosis. Uh, which is this disease from a mild to a more severe form. And if you want to, as a dentist, if you want to battle that, this is irreversible. It's, uh, you can't just change it. You can't just take it out of the teeth. You have to have invasive dental treatment, cosmetic procedures, like with the best would be uh, like uh, ceramic veneers. That, but, uh, this is a very invasive procedure that can go wrong and needs to be monitored for the rest of their lives. And it's super expensive. I mean, if if you have to have your front teeth done six teeth, right? So, again. so Dirk, what about um, using fluoride uh, in the toothpaste? Sorry, you're breaking up a bit. Sorry, what was that? Oh, what about using fluoride in the toothpaste? Well, fluoride in the toothpaste uh, is only allowed uh, up to a certain concentration. And uh, fluoride in the toothpaste is supposed to integrate then into the, remin into the enamel and remineralize it. But there is now lots of doubts about that, that it will have any effect anyway, because the concentration is so low. But on the other hand, it's high enough to put warning signs of, onto the toothpaste. And the warning signs say something along the lines like, if you... Uh, don't have it in reach of children below the age of six. And if you swallow more of what's normally used for brushing your teeth, which is a minimal amount, just what you squirt on the toothbrush, then you should seek the, uh, in the disease control center or something. I mean, it's, really, <laughs> it's on the toothpaste. Yeah. And the little uh, kids up to the age of six, they love to swallow that stuff because it kind of tastes so yeah. right. So, and, and they can be in serious trouble because of the toxins in there. Right. But it's, it's, not just, it's not just that because, see, fluorosis is somehow a disease that only reflects what might be going on in the whole system because it's not just that the fluoride is integrated in your teeth. It, it's in the bones, yeah, and if you're an infant... It doesn't uh, breach the blood-brain barrier, so you don't have it in the brain itself, unless you're, you're, you're an infant, because then the blood-brain barrier is not established properly. So, properly. so it can go into the brain as well. Right. And now and there's way bigger issues here, way bigger issues with the fluoride toxicity. And uh, because we now have, there are... Many, many studies, more than 30, 40 studies coming out from countries like China or Iran or Mexico, which point to the fact that, that fluoride causes the IQ, the intelligence, to drop. Yes, I'm familiar um, with those studies. And, you know, yeah. one, uh, you know, it may not be very permeable to the blood-brain barrier, but, you know, children also get a lot of immunizations. And uh, one of the things contained in these vaccines is uh, polysorbate 80, which we may know as a preservative. But actually, polysorbate 80 increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. So it actually allows more things to get into the brain. And um, if you have a dental treatment or swallow some fluoridated water or some toothpaste uh, right before a vaccine, then you could have a, an easy route to get some of this fluoride into your central nervous system. And uh, I am familiar with uh, some of the studies showing that uh, children who are exposed to fluor fluoride do have lower IQs, just like they do with lead poisoning. 
So this is uh, definitely something concerning. Um, I certainly don't use fluoride even in my toothpaste and haven't for a number of years and haven't noticed any issues with tooth decay. Uh, my teeth remain as healthy as they were before that. So, uh, Dirk, what kind of things do you recommend uh, to use for routine dental care? Well, uh, for routine dental, it's more when you brush your teeth and gums, it's more about uh, mechanically cleaning them. It's not so about, about the chemicals that you use. I personally would not use any of the commercial toothpaste. I don't use them that you get in the supermarket. I personally use uh, some uh, more organic toothpastes, which, uh, yeah, but I'm very aware I only, uh, not fluoride containing, I don't touch fluoride. Uh, those toothpaste, it's, I'm very aware of the fact that uh, they are more for the taste and the good smell and nice breath than for tooth health. Right. Uh, because it's, uh, if you have good nutrition and if you have this, what, what are the lymph flow that goes from the inside out, you've got this internal tooth uh, brush happening. You, and you need to remove the plaque mechanically. It's, uh, and this is often what I see is what most patients get wrong. You're told somehow to, to brush twice daily, but you're not told of how to brush. <laughs> and, and there's a big difference because most people really, unfortunately, I always start with my patients to show them how to brush the teeth properly in between teeth and using, I'm a big fan of an electric toothbrush. Uh, because they are fantastic little machines and they they make your life easier. It's, but if you want your, that, that, as a comparison, if you want to clean your dishes, you've got lots of dishes, you do it by hand or you use the machine. And uh, with an electric toothbrush, you don't need to have a fancy, very expensive one, the basic model will do. But it's about the technique. I actually put up a video on my website where I explain that in detail. Uh, it's about brushing along the gum line and it's most importantly also to brush between teeth and you can use floss for that but if you have a little bit of gum disease what happens is that the space between teeth get a little bit bigger then you need to use uh, interdental brushes and if you get that right those two things then those are excellent conditions to keep your teeth healthy with the good nutrition well, that sounds great. Uh, yeah. Will you make sure that uh, we have a link uh, to that video in the show notes so people can see your uh, toothbrushing instructions? Yes, they can do that. So, Fantastic. Are you familiar with uh, Ipsab powder? I-P-S-A-B? No. Oh, so this is um, uh, a preparation. Um, it's basically a, a form of tooth powder, and it, it has uh, salt and some uh, bicarbonate of sodium, and then it has um, this tree bark. I can't remember the name of it, but it's essentially just an abrasive. And um, so this has been developed as an alternative, and um, you, you can actually buy it commercially, or you can make up a similar solution, but it just adds a little bit of abrasiveness uh, in conjunction with the toothbrush uh, to get a proper clean. Yeah. And then I also uh, occasionally will use activated charcoal, um, for toothbrushing as a whitening agent and to remove stains, and it, it works phenomenally well. Yes, uh, yes, that's true. Charcoal's excellent. Uh, Andy, let me just bring it back one more time to the fluoride, because uh, we know that fluoride, uh, the systemic effects, uh, it's about the pineal gland, which is it gets uh, attracts fluoride like the enamel does. So the pineal gland uh, on a physical level, of course, it's, it's a very, very little kind of gland. Uh, it's only a rice core size and it's only one tenth to one twentieth of a gram. That's, this is how small it is. But uh, as you know, it has quite some important regulatory uh, properties to it. It produces melatonin and it somehow helps maintain the wake and sleep cycle. But that's only on the physical level. But uh, if we if we go more like look at other cultures on from a spiritual level, it's many cultures, uh, and it gets calcified by the fluoride. So it uh, so if we have fluoride, this there are uh, 
crystals in the gland that somehow attract the fluoride like the enamel does of the teeth. But on a spiritual level, the, the, the pineal gland is always seen as the, uh, the third eye because it also has some uh, the same structure as the eye has with the retina, the cornea, and light-sensitive nerve endings. But it's also seen as the seat of the soul by many cultures. And if we muck around with that, then it probably has also quite some influence on our well-being and on our the way we perceive ourselves on this planet, on, on, on planet Earth. Uh, so, and these are factors that are coming with the, with the fluoride that hasn't been taken into account at all. And I just wanted to point that out. And those are the things that are really concerning, I find. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm certainly familiar with the spiritual and esoteric significance of the pineal gland, which is shaped like a pine cone or in form like a pine cone, which is where the name comes from. And absolutely, it's uh, the third eye or the third eye chakra, uh, which is a uh, uh, part of us that can see at a higher spiritual level and also helps integrate the divine uh, masculine and feminine into a whole so you could see how suppression of the third eye from a spiritual and esoteric perspective would help uh, keep humanity functioning at a lower level uh, so they would be easier to control and less likely to develop themselves into higher spiritual planes um, so this uh, does have quite a significance and also what you mentioned about the uh, melatonin and the sleep-wake cycles is uh, very critical because um, you may not find these complaints as a dentist but as a physician I'll tell you that almost every single person that I talk to um, in a clinical setting has problems related to sleep and uh, our whole culture has evolved uh, to make uh, it very difficult to follow the normal uh, light cycles of the sun with day and night and having our sleep and wake cycles timed to the natural cycles. And so this is, I'm sure, further disrupted by this calcification, which, which by the way, has been documented in medical studies as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very true. Okay. Very concerning. So there are lots of things with the fluoride that uh, are concerning, and, and they are mostly related to the uh, to the systemic use of fluoride. Uh, and there's so much research out there about uh, fluoride in the water and its negative effects. But somehow the dental authorities, it's it's a very emotive subject, and it, and uh, dentists defend that with their lives the, the whole fluoride thing. But then the whole medic, the whole dental system is somehow built around the theory that fluoride is good, and and uh, but it does not even show these great effects on caries reduction because caries in in, in children is still rampant. So and it doesn't take into account uh, the more systemic uh, viewpoints that we discussed earlier. Right, like the like the children are not receiving the proper nutrition and then of course if they are not breastfed the uh, baby formulas have uh, lots of added sugar uh, which changes the uh, biochemistry of the mouth and they don't have necessarily the proper nutrition in terms of the fat soluble vitamins like k2 that we were discussing so they may not have this natural uh, tooth uh, health uh, lymph flow system uh, in operation, or at least not optimally. And so all of these factors are at play. You know, it's so, um, once again, not surprising that nutrition is actually a major factor here, but not in the way that we have always thought that if we just avoid, you know, sugary drinks, uh, that will be okay. It's actually that we have to eat the right things as well uh, to support the normal function and keep our teeth healthy. Exactly, yeah. Mm. True. So it's a big problem. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, Dirk, was there any uh, additional things that you wanted to uh, summarize here to uh, to sort of wrap up our discussion for the day? No, I think that uh, we could talk all day long about these subjects, but I think uh, I I brought forward what I wanted to say actually. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I can't wait to uh, look at that uh, video on the toothbrushing and show it to my kids and uh, see if they've been doing it right.
<laughs> okay. Yeah, and so. you can find it. Yes. So that's uh, if you want to look at my videos, I uh, I continually put out more little videos, and they are I find them quite interesting because. Uh, what I'm trying to do with those videos is I try to educate people on very important subjects, like the toothbrushing that's really so elemental to, to, to good health. Uh, and uh, yes, I would be happy if some if people would give me some comments on them. And uh, yeah. Fantastic. So Dr. Dirk, where can the viewers find your videos and where can they get in touch with you, uh, possibly for a consultation or more information? Yeah, well, I do have a website, and which is I just bring that up. So that's called dentaldecoded.com, and you can reach me on on this address, Dr. Dirk at dentaldecoded.com. Now this is April. I'm up and running now, so that's all up and running. I also do consultations for people who feel the need to talk to someone uh, from the comfort of their home. Uh, I do video consultations, and if someone feels the need to discuss these things more from outside the box of conventional dentistry, then I would be more than happy to do that. Well, that's fantastic. And uh, what about, you said that you have a YouTube channel now, what's that called? Uh, well, that's also Dental Decoded. If people put in, in the search about Dental Decoded, then I should come up. But all the videos are also on my website, so people can have a link from my website to all the videos that I'm producing at the moment. And they're all between five and ten minutes long, and uh, so it's they don't drag on forever. So <laughs> not like not like my interviews, huh? <laughs> well, you, you have quite amazing content, Andy. So. <laughs> Well, Dirk, it's really been a pleasure. Uh, not only uh, is it great to have you here as a dental expert, but it's great to have a friend uh, join the show and have a nice discussion. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone out there for uh, watching. And uh, we'll keep making more of these videos. And I'm, I'm sure we'll have Dr. Dirk back again in the future. So take care, everyone, and goodbye.